I tend to do the um, the Mickey Mouse version of Vedanta, all right, because we have such great teachers here, and really the best in the world, that and they do it so they teach it so succinctly that what I tend to do is try and fill in some of the holes and for really people who are fairly new to it all and some of the terminology that gets a little bit lost um, so myself and my wife we've been running a, a meditation and Vedanta group from our home for about nine years and uh, more recently I've started a, um, a Vedanta class in, in Reading on Sunday mornings and this festival to us was a way of trying to bring in the very large width that is yoga, right from rightful living to self-realization, all within one site. So wherever you are in your journey, you can go and fulfill that and then take a sneak in in what is the next destination on that journey. And you can sit in at the back of the class pretend that you're not being noticed and you can then figure out this sounds interesting and then you can go away find a teacher that teaches that aspect of it that you would enjoy and then just take your step a little bit further that's what this festival is all about and I'm hoping that you're taking advantage of that there are certain things that have attracted you to come here but there, are, there is so much more on offer for you to try. So it's a bit like a Disneyland. You know, you pay once at the door and you can go on any ride. And you can go on any ride any number of times. And the difference is that you don't queue. Here you can walk straight in, sit down, and you're, you're participating straight away. So that's, that's really the idea of what we want to do here. And it's great to see all of you, all of you here supporting us. What I wanted to do today was, um, today and tomorrow, I want to really cover two of the most asked questions that I've had in all the time that I've been uh, dealing with Vedanta and, and teaching and so forth. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a terminology. Unfortunately, these, these two topics are also the most difficult there are in Vedanta. So trying to explain them is going to be a really a concerted effort, but that's what I'm trying to do in this session and the one tomorrow. So in this session, I'm trying to cover consciousness. It comes up over and over and over again, and until you have an understanding of what is consciousness, you really can't go any further. So that's what we'll try and do. Today, tomorrow, enlightenment. Another grossly misused word. What is enlightenment? Who is enlightened? And do I have to walk funny when I'm enlightened? Right. People ask all sorts of questions about what is enlightenment? How do I recognize it? So these are the two topics. But as usual, I, so tell me by a raise of hands, who's fairly, who would consider themselves fairly new to Advaita Vedanta? Raise your hands. Okay. And who think, and, and therefore the others are fairly hard. I, can, I know a few of the hardcore ones, and hopefully they'll be, they'll be kind to me. So, okay. So let's, let's go back to basics. Vedanta comes from the Vedas. The Vedas are a body of knowledge Nobody really knows how old, but everybody says beyond 5,000 years, mainly because at about the 5,000 year mark, it was actually written down. It was written down when Sanskrit was first introduced, about 3,500 BCE. And before that, it was an oral tradition passed on, parampara tradition from, from teacher to student in an oral manner. And that's why large part of um, the Vedas were actually sung because it's much easier to pass on something that is sung rather than something that is prose. So it was, it was done in that way. Um, and uh, there was so much of it, there was so much to the Vedas that it was actually allocated to four families, as it were, to preserve. 
and therefore we've got four classifications of or collections of the Vedic material, right? And they're considered to be the four Vedas. So they were looked after by a particular family or clan so that it would survive. And then passed on, passed on down through the generations. The Vedas themselves are an operating manual for life. If you consider yourself to be the product, all right, any product that's manufactured requires an operations manual. And so that person with the product can figure out how to operate it fully. The Vedas are the operating manual for human beings. And therefore, it has to cover all human beings. Not just the ones who are very bright, or the ones who are very dim. All human beings in all states of their journey. Right? It's the operating manual. And therefore, it recognizes that for most people, they are in the materialistic world. You're here, you perform things, you do things, you first of all have a desire, you execute that desire through an action, that action yields a result. You then evaluate the result, am I in a better situation now as a result of, the, of my actions or in a worse situation? If you're in a better situation, you repeat it. If you're in a worse situation, you say, oh, I better do something different next time. So we spend our entire lives in this desire, action, evaluation, which leads to the subsequent desire, action, evaluation. And we go around in this circle, and then we die. All right. So we're in this circle, and most of this desire is built around a materialistic goal, which means that my desire is based on the fact that I want to be happier than I am. There'd be no other reason to have a desire. And you must have desires. Don't, don't ever think that, that Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta says, get rid of your desires. If you got rid of your desires, you wouldn't get out of bed because you wouldn't have a desire to get out of bed. All right? And the action that follows it is to get out of bed. Why? Because I'll be a better condition walking around on my feet than sleeping on the bed now that I'm awake, all right? You're trying to improve your life through every single action and you evaluate it and therefore we perform those actions again, all right? So the Vedas said, if you want a materialistic result, let me help you. If you're of that inclination, thinking that what you're going to perform as an action is gonna yield a better materialistic state for yourself. Materialism means I have more. More happiness, more fun, a better relationship, more money, all the aspects that the world has for you. You want more of that because you feel that you need more of that. If you're poor, you want more money. If you're unhappy with a relationship, you want that to improve. If you have no children, you might want children. So you want more of something that is an object in the world, materialism. And so the Vedas said, these are all the, the rituals that you can perform in order to achieve anything you like. And they're all written down. You can do them and they're, they're prescribed. You perform this ritual in this way at that time of the year and whatever you repeat it this many times and the, the, if you do it properly, the result will be what you seek. That's for the materialistic people. All right. Large part of the Vedas, the initial part of the Vedas, are all about achieving a materialistic result. If you want more money, there's a mantra for it. If you want children, there's a mantra for it. You may have to work very hard. Right. You may have to say a prayer a hundred thousand times, but it, it, it will yield its result if that action is performed correctly. Materialistic part. And during all that materialism, you get to the stage, ultimately, when you have everything that you've desired and you suddenly find 
that you still aren't happy. And a lot of those people, especially in America, we lived in America for about eight years in California. And I got very tired when I started to hear things like, we're down to our last half million. <laughs> and so whatever you have, you want more of. So, so in this way, the first part of the Vedas saying, perform those rituals and you'll get what you seek. But when you have what you've sought and you still aren't happy, you ask yourself the question, is there more? And this question is accelerated by trauma. If you have a trauma in your life, something happens to your children, something happens to your relationship, something happens to you, all right? Trauma is something that you're finding very difficult to cope with. At that point, you realize that nothing that you have Nothing that you know, nothing that you are, can currently solve the problem in front of you. And you normally have this in a midlife crisis, all right? And you think to yourself, it's very sad. I've educated myself, right? I've got myself jobs, I've got myself, my, my acquisitions are around me, and I've suddenly got this problem that I cannot solve. Now you start to ask the question, are there things that I don't know, that I don't have, that I am not, that if I had those things, I could solve this problem? And the main thing with trauma, of course, is that you're deeply unhappy with trauma. What do you want? You want the trauma to go away. You want your happiness to come back. In fact, ultimately, all we want is permanent happiness. In fact, you think about it. Every action you perform is in order to be happier than you currently are. And what we all want is to be permanently happy. And it's the one thing that's impossible to achieve. Right? We all want to achieve something that is not possible to achieve. You want to be permanently happy. Be why can't you be permanently happy? Because the world moves in cycles. You move in cycles. You can be deliriously happy in one moment and then go down to absolutely nothing another moment. And it goes up and down. People call it the ups and downs of life, if you like, the samsara of life. But you don't want it to be like that. Why? Because you have sampled extreme happiness. At some moments in your life, there are moments when you've looked at a child's face and for that split second, there's been no other thought or worry in your mind. And for that moment, a gentle smile comes on your face and you are really, really happy. It can happen with pistachio ice cream. <laughs> All right. It can happen with any other state. It can happen with music or something that you've been working on for so long and suddenly seems to play. In. It could be the happiness of others. You've achieved, you've, you've been witness to the happiness of others. You are extremely happy for that purpose and you've sampled it. You know, and once you've sampled the very best that you can be, you want it to persist. You want that happiness all the time. And you can't understand why you can't have it all the time. Because it seems to come, you know when it's come, and then it goes down again and you think, where did it go? All right? So, when you have, when you're a materialist, and you have all the things that you asked for, and you're still unhappy, then you have to ask yourself the question, my happiness surely can't come from these material objects. Because if it could, since I have all the material objects and I'm still not happy, it's proof that it doesn't come from material objects. Right? There has to be more. And then you become a seeker. And most of you are seekers. Right? 
you haven't, most of you haven't quite figured out what you're seeking, except you want to be happier when you've found it. All right? So you become a seeker. And in that process, you ask yourself the three basic questions. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And they've asked this for thousands of years. And that's how it came to me. I became a seeker. And I asked these questions. And I thought, I'm reasonably bright. I'm not the brightest tool in the toolbox, but I'm also not the dullest, right? But I know that there's been plenty of people much brighter than me. I remember being at university and I went to a summer day at the Astronomy Center at Cambridge. And um, it was a really hot day and it was the radio telescopes that are around Cambridge. And there was this guy in shorts and a t-shirt, enthusiastic about explaining radio astronomy, right? And it's afterwards I found out that he was the Nobel Prize winner that discovered quasars, all right? I remember going to my professor thinking three weeks of, of something, various things, and he would come back and said, oh yes, we thought of that in 58, but didn't have the technology, all right? You can get put downs like that all the time. So you know, you know that there are people brighter than you. You know that you are brighter than other people. You fall somewhere in between, all right? So knowing this, this level of brightness, you come to seek. You come to try and find out what will make you happy. Now, in order to do that, you say, surely other people have tackled this problem. All right? And since there are people in the world that are much brighter than me, thousands of years ago, I mean, ever since people started to think, they must have asked these basic questions. And therefore, there must be an answer out there coming from these really bright people. And you go back through all the, first of all, you start quizzing the self-help section of the, of the local bookshop, don't you? And then you gradually find the modern Western philosophers and you read through those things. And you don't understand half the stuff. And then you get deeper and deeper and you eventually find out they all point to the Vedas. They all point to the Vedas. And then you think, I have to study what the Vedas say. And the Vedas say, if you want to mater be materialistic, here you are. But if you want more, I can show you more. And read through the Vedas, and you get to the end section of the Vedas, and in the end sections are what are called the Upanishads. These are, these are the wisdom traditions. This is the knowledge by which you can move from materialism to spiritualism the knowledge that you need in order to make that migration from materialism to spiritualism. Remember, this is the manual for human beings. Therefore, it must cover all human beings. And since most human beings are materialistic, the bulk of the Vedas are full of all of these mantras to get you all the things that you want. And the little section at the end is where the knowledge is. These Upanishads, at one time, there was something like uh, 1,080 Upanishads. They've been lost in time. They were, when, when writing, when Sanskrit came down, they started to write them on palm leaves, and these disintegrated. And really, they were preserved by Adi Shankara, a, a ninth century monk. And the ones that we study today, there's about 108 that are left. We've lost about 900 to 1,000 a, a of them. And out of these 108, some 10 or 11, how, depending on how you classify them, are studied most often now, mostly because Adi Shankara left the commentaries, the explanation of what these words mean, <coughs> that led people to be able to study them easily. Okay? So we study the Upanishads in this way. So there's 10 or 11 Upanishads, and in there is the wisdom that you seek. Because they come at the end of the Vedas, the Anta. They are known 
as Ved Anta. Veda Anta. When you end with a vowel and begin with a vowel, you drop one of the vowels, it becomes Vedanta. All right. And the type of Vedanta that, uh, that is being discussed here so beautifully by, by our teachers here is Advaita Vedanta. And that says, Advaita means not two. All right. It doesn't say one, it just says not two. Sanskrit is one of these strange things where you have, you're, you're able to classify verbs with the singular, the dual, and then the multiple, right? It's the not two. So there's not two, Advaita Vedanta. But this, the Vedas, therefore, are a body of knowledge, right? There are means of knowing. In order for you to be able to appreciate this knowledge, you must prepare yourself. So the middle of the Vedas are designed for you to migrate between materialism to spiritualism through preparation of the mind. Because that's where the information is going to come in. That's the only instrument through which we can receive and analyze information content. Okay? So the middle of the Vedas are dedicated to Upashana meditation. Meditation, why? So that you can control the mind, control the mind of thoughts, so that you can vacate the mind of the thousands of thoughts that auto-repeat. You can clear some space so that the knowledge can go in. And the knowledge has to go in. Don't think that you can sit there going, Om, and you'll be enlightened in about 3,423 hours of Om meditation. It's not going to work. Right? Knowledge has to come in. You're just clearing the space. So there's two types of meditation. Before you receive the knowledge, the meditation is to clear the space. And after you receive the meditation, after you receive the knowledge, the meditation is known as Vedantic meditation, and that's for contemplation of the knowledge that you've just heard. Two types of meditation. So you go from materialism, Right? You work your way through the Vedas. No, nah, that's not for me. I had all of those things. I'm still not happy. There must be, there must be more. It says, go into meditation, vacate your mind, right? control your mind, so that you're no longer driven by your mind. You allow space to go in. That means you have to park your ego. Right? You have to park your ego to one side. Because normally what we do, we process information as it comes in, and say, that doesn't sound right, all right? Or I heard it differently over there. What you're doing is analyzing something based on something that you know. And often, you discount something that does not sound right. New piece of knowledge comes to you, and you say, it does not sound right. What are you doing? You're in judgment. Judgment based on what you know. You're rejecting something that's new based on something you already know. If you reject something new, then how are you going to learn? So it says, in order to do this, put your ego to one side and just listen. Listen without judgment. Listen well enough so that you could recite it, you could paraphrase it back, if required. And once you have understand, understood what has been said, now analyze and ask the questions. Ask the questions of your teacher until everything that you've heard is clear to you. That's the second stage. And once it is clear to you, it has become your truth, then you, you consume it and you realize it in your entirety. That third part, why is it required? Because mostly, when we have a situation that confronts us, the last thing we do in the reaction is think. Right? When the situation happens in front, you act instinctively. Because instinctive action is not performed through the intellectual reasoning, you can stay in your old self. 
You can know the knowledge that is in with Vedanta and your reactions will be instinctive rather than knowledgeable. So you need the third stage of Nidhityasana to take that knowledge in and make it yours at the subconscious level. So when you have a reaction to an event, that reaction is based upon that truth and not your old egoic self. That's why you need the third stage. Right? So Advaita Vedanta starts to say you can have supreme happiness once you understand the three basic things. And the three basic things are everything you've come to believe in your life is wrong. All right? Everything that you've come to know in your life so far, in your search, is actually wrong. So you consider yourself to be this finite mortal state, all right, that, is, that was born and is going to die, and that only knows a certain amount of information, is limited. We all know we're limited. I mean, I can't read a book without glasses. My, my eyesight is limited. I don't know what's happening beyond here. I can't receive Radio 4. I know <laughs> that I'm limited, all right? And, and Vedanta says, no, you're unlimited. Not only that, you're immortal. And you have the strength of everything. I tell you, when I lift those boxes for the festival, I don't feel that I'm unlimited at all, all right? So I've come to believe that I'm limited in all sorts of ways, and Vedanta says you're not, all right? And secondly, Vedanta says that this world of all the material objects that you consider to be real, that you've interacted with all of your life, they're actually not real. All right? And reality in, in, in Vedanta definition is something that exists in the three periods of time. It's permanent. It was there in the past, there now, will be in the future. That's called reality. And everything that you see around you is transient. All right? It's transactional. It's very good, it's transactional. I mean, that, that cup over there with the water is transactional. If it wasn't there, the water would run away. All right? It's just that what is the water and what is the cup? If I took that plastic cup and I made some lines across this and just split the cup and I had a flat piece of plastic, where did the cup go? All right? Imagine this cup. So I, I, I know, foolishly tear, I take, get rid of the water, I drink the water, and I foolishly tear this down and I make a nice flower plastic flower out of it, all right? Same plastic, but where did the cup go? And Vedanta says, everything that you consider, all the objects in the world that you consider to be real are actually not real. So your, your life, the rug of your life has just been taken away from you, right? From under your feet. First of all, you, were, you thought your all yourself as limited and suddenly it says you're unlimited. All the things around you you thought were real, you can feel them and transact with them, hit people over the head with them, and suddenly it says it's not real, all right? And then finally, it says, you know this idea of God? And some people would say, no, I don't believe in God. Do you believe in an energy that runs the system? Do you believe in, a, in an energy that makes every blade of grass grow? All the things happen that you are no part of? Well, if you believe in, in all of that and you call it some sort of divine power, universal power, it says that power is you. And suddenly you've been completely blown out of the water because everything that you've come to believe in your very successful, intelligent life university educated, it's all been removed from you and it takes you back to square one. All right. In order to be able to understand that, you need to be able to understand the first principle of who you are. Because the world is relative to you, right? It's centered the center of your world is you. 
You react to everything in the world, and it's your reaction. Therefore, if you are going to go on a journey to find out who you truly are, then it starts, and what the world is, then it starts with you. And you have to understand who you are. It's like, you know, any journey starts with the first step, and the first step is figuring out who you are. And Vedanta says this magic word, you are consciousness. And suddenly you go, oh, I followed you so far. But when you say you're consciousness, that's really, that's really, really tricky. What's this consciousness business? I know that I'm conscious of things. All right. I know I'm conscious as in I'm awake. I'm not unconscious as in a coma. I understand that. But what is this consciousness? And Vedanta says very easily. Vedanta says consciousness is that by which you know your thoughts. It doesn't say who you are. It says that by which you know your thoughts. In fact, know anything that's going on around you. So at this point, you've got to figure out. And you have to, you know, they analyze this down to the minutest level. Figure out how do we come to know anything at all? Right? If you say a statement, is that by which you know your thoughts or you know, come to know something, you have to know what knowledge is. Right? Our knowledge comes to us primarily through our five senses. Okay? I, need to, I don't need to say them, the sight, nose, and that, tongue, all of those things. Those are our five senses. The sense of touch is all over our skin. All right? These senses collect the information and they put them into our mind, into our brain, where they are processed as information and then analyzed for content. They're processed by the mind, so vision, for instance, is processed through the visual cortex. So you come to know that you're seeing, that your eyes are open, and what you're seeing. But to understand what you're really seeing, that this object that you see is a glass, that comes from the intellect. The fact that you see something comes from the mind, and the intellect says, oh, what you're seeing is something that I've seen before. I'll just ask memory for a moment. Oh, yes, I've downloaded it. As far as I can tell, that's a glass, all right? And you come to know that, and where do you come to know that? In here, right? And because most of our senses bring in information at this level, we tend to think that the knowledge base is in the brain. Because the eyes go in like that, the ears go like that, the nose goes, the taste goes like that. So we think that it's all over here. If your eyes were in your knees, right? The whole perspective of the world would change. And you might think that your knees was the knowledge base for sight. It just so happens that we've got a great collection of them around our face. So therefore, we go inwards from the face and we say, ah, that's where it is. That's where I'm finding it out. That's the intellect. That's, that's the me at the middle of all of this. All right? So, now, so we collect all of this and we play it out in the mind. We collect all of this information and play it out in the mind. It's important for you to realize that when you come to know something, the only place you know it is inside your mind. There's nowhere else that it exists except inside your mind. That's why you can color it. Color it with memory, rose-tinted glasses. You can actually see things differently to other people seeing it. Because you're only seeing it as an illusion, a play inside your mind. It's being projected on a screen. You happen to be sitting in the audience. It's one of these touchy-feely films. You know, you've got all the five senses, and it's being played out in front of you, and you are the observer. That's how you come to know. We have no way of telling that the grass is green. Because the only place we can see it is inside our heads. We just assume that the grass is green. We assume that there's grass out there, right? 
Because there's no way, if you went to go and feel it, you can say, Ram, this is definitely grass, right? Where are you feeling it? In your mind, right? That's why we see the world through the limitations of the power of our five senses. That's why we can't see infrared. We can see in color, but not in black and white. So the world looks to us according to the quality of our five senses, and we do it all inside our heads. That's where all the analysis is happening. And we do it through, and the Vedas said, you want to know how to come to know something? First one is perception through the five senses. Perception. Easy to understand. Then how else do we come to know it? There are other means of knowing. The one after perception is inference. How do you come to know something? And the example they always give is that the fire on the other side of the lake, you can't see the fire, but you can see the smoke. Inference, there must be a fire because there's no smoke without fire. You can't see the fire, but you come to know that there's a fire without being able to perceive it just by perceiving the smoke through inference. Okay? The next one is presumption. I know, complicated words. I can't spell them either. So the next one is presumption. You get up. We've been doing this a lot the last two, three days. The pavement is wet. It's not raining. Presumption is it rained during the night. You didn't see the rain. All right? But you've come to know that it rained during the night. You now have some knowledge through presumption. All right? Everybody okay? Then there's similarity. You can come to know something. Somebody says, oh, did you know of a zebra? You say, I don't know what a zebra is. They'll say, oh, it's like a horse with black and white stripes. Actually, you don't have black and white stripes. You either have black stripes or you white stripes. I don't know what a zebra is. It could be a black stripe on a white horse or a white stripe on a black horse. I have no idea. But uh, a zebra is like a horse with stripes on it. All right? And suddenly, you got an idea in your mind of what a zebra is. You've never seen one, but you've now acquired this knowledge. All right? Fifth one is negation. Negation is to say, you come to know that something is not there. So somebody tells you, go to that room and see if there's anyone there. All right? And you go to the room and you see no one. Remember, look at the language. You see no one. What does no one look like? All right? No one looks like the absence of someone. That's what no one looks like. And you come to know that there's no one through the absence of someone. So the absence of something is also knowledge. Right? If I say that there's an elephant on my hand, you know that there's no elephant on my hand. Right? Therefore, you come to know something that I'm not speaking the truth. Right? The absence of something can lead to knowledge. And the final one are words. Words lead to knowledge. When you read words, you needn't have gone to Rishikesh. You don't know how the Ganges flows through Rishikesh, but you l read a lovely story about it, a description of it, and it gives you, in your mind's eye, knowledge of a place. All right? Words are the final thing. Those words themselves can be delivered through um, an author, in which case, you are seeing the world through the eyes of the author as placed into words. In fact, you come to know that all of the five states that I've said before, I'm going to test you now. What was the first means of knowing? Perception. Perception. Second one? Inference. The smoke and the fire. Remember the inference. Third one is? Presumption. The fourth one, similarity. similarity, and the fifth one is negation. negation, and the final one is word. So you, and you come to realize that they're all based on perception, right? 
in order for you to know that there's a fire because you've seen the smoke you must see the smoke all right in order for you to know that it rained during the night you have to see the rain so they're all based on perception and perception happens in the mind and the mind is controlled by the intellect so if you are going to come to any means of knowledge and Vedanta says I can give you the means of knowledge to find out who you are that means is going to come into your mind with the only instrument we have to analyze it and that's the intellect and we are that's why we're we're the species we are that's why it we, it's a celebration to be human right a cow in the morning doesn't meditate and say I wonder who I am all right an animal is instinctively driven it doesn't go to America and decides that it's not going to be vegetarian anymore all right these these you they're driven by what they are we are able to make these choices and that's why we abuse the world because we have the power of choice if we were instinctively driven we would be natural with the world all right as animals live in a natural environment something that persists forever it's only because we have the choice we think we're in control that we go around and change things all right and our ego is very strong all right when we drop a ball onto our hand we say I dropped the ball did you drop the ball who thinks that they dropped the ball when when they let go of the ball and the ball goes down is the ball dropped I dropped the ball and what did gravity do all this time how would you have dropped the ball without gravity is gravity that took the ball down once you let go of it you didn't drop the ball gravity dropped the ball all right you say well I initiated it I let go of it did you let go of it your fingers went that way all right is your fingers a material thing went like that and the ball dropped out of your hand while well, I drove the nerves that made the fingers go that way all right and then the nerves well the nerves did it did you do it well I control the nerves through the brain and ultimately you get back to the head again and ultimately the ego says I initiated it all right the ego likes to take over and the ego likes to say I we've been brought up all our lives thinking that that is the biggest I there is and suddenly Vedanta says no the ego is the small I there's a bigger I and this oh, you get flummox you get sidetracked by this and it says that I is consciousness that by which you know your thoughts and actions all right and this is the question that we get most often in trying to understand this and it was beautifully said I mean I'm just I'm just paraphrasing things that have been already said within this um, within this festival by other great teachers you come to know your thoughts you must know your thoughts and Vedanta says we can analyze how you come to know your thoughts we know how there are means of knowing by which you know things and we've just been through them and this process of knowing has three factors to it when you come to know an object phone all right you have a means so this is the object that you know these are means of knowing eyesight all right and there's a knower you know that it's a phone there's always three stages you're the knower this is the known and there's a means of knowing everything that you come to know has these three stages <coughs> all right so I'm the knower there's a process of knowing and there are objects that have come to be known if the object is the known then the knower is the subject I'm the subject that's the object and there's a means of knowing all right and it's very easy with physical things phones bodies right object I know means of knowing touch 
sight, sound, whatever, this is the known. The beautiful thing about it is the knower and the known cannot be the same. Right? You have a car. Hands up anyone who thinks they're a car. All right? You can see the car. You can see a bicycle. You can see a speaker. You can see a tent. You are not the tent. However large you may feel, you are not a tent. All right? So, the knower and the known cannot be the same thing. If I know my body, I cannot be the body. <coughs> this is in the, the, what they call the gross, the gross body. Beyond that is the subtle body. The subtle body, why do they call there's these three bodies and they give these names, subtle bodies. All right? What's the subtle body? Subtle body is something that is imperceptible to your senses. All right? That's why they call it a subtle body. Everything else is a gross body because they're perceptible to your senses. You can see it, you can touch it, you can taste it. All. You can do anything you like to, to, with a subtle body, you can't, right? You can't poke a thought. You can't sniff out a memory, all right? It's not perceptible to your senses. And you say, well, if it's not perceptible to my senses, how do I know I've got a subtle body? Right? And you say, well, do you have any memory? Do you have any emotion? Do you have any thoughts? Where are they happening? Your right knee? All right? No, they're happening in your subtle body. And that's associated. So we, we know for certain that we have a subtle body, although there's no scientist out there that can actually point to it. They can't say that the picture of your mother is here. They haven't found it yet, all right? It's imperceptible to senses. So we have a, this, this subtle body that is, that is thinking away, and so within this we have an emotion and a thought. Do you know what you're thinking about? Most of the time, right? I have a thought. I have a thought. What's the object? The thought, all right? You have a means of knowing, all right? You know the thought. So who is the knower? Who's the subject? Because the subject and the object can never be the same. Therefore, if you have a thought, you cannot be the thought. Because if you were the thought, you wouldn't be able to know it. Do you see? There has to be a knower, there has to be the known, and there has to be a process of knowing. So if you have a thought, if you have a memory, if you have an experience, you cannot be that. If you eat the pistachio ice cream, you are not the pistachio ice cream. Right? If you have a memory of childhood playing, that's a memory, that's the object. You are not that memory. And therefore, the ultimate subject must be beyond your physical body, must be beyond your thought processes. Everything that happens in the subtle mind, in the subtle body, thoughts, emotions, perceptions. Remember I said that all of our perceptions come in and are played out in our mind. That is something that we come to know. We are the knower. Right? You say, well, <coughs> clearly, Ram, the knower is the ego. It's the little eye. Well, the, to me, it's the big eye, you know. I, I'm the ego. The ego knows. Right? The ego is a thought process. The ego is a thought process. So, if you know that you're being, you're acting egotistically, all right? There's a knower that knows how the ego is acting. So who's the knower? You say, well, must be another thought. One thought so knows another thought that knows the third thought. And you go back and back and back, and you go, you're backing up against the wall here, trying to find the primary thought that knows all the other thoughts in the sequence of chains, right? There can be no such thing. Because you'll, go, you'll regress forever. So there must be something that knows. 
and they said this is the awareness, this consciousness. It's very difficult to try and understand what this really means. All right? If you're this, the knower, the ultimate knower of all of these things. Now, if you have a thought, say you were deliriously happy this morning, sun's going to come out. All right? Yesterday, you were deliriously, no, you can't be deliriously unhappy, but you were unhappy yesterday, all right? And suddenly from yesterday, you knew you were unhappy yesterday because you got wet, and now today you're happy, so your, your emotions have gone from here to here, and you knew both of those emotional states, all right? If you were those emotions, then you would rise, rise with the emotion, and you wouldn't be able to detect it. Let me give you an example. I'm traveling down the motorway at 70 miles an hour. Something I never do. I always go 69. <laughs> You're traveling down the motorway. No, I lie. 70 miles an hour, all right? And there's a car beside you, very annoyingly, traveling at exactly the same speed, 70 miles an hour. You look over your shoulder, and the car is basically to you, relative to you, stationary. And he's drinking a cup of coffee. Or worse still, making a phone call. And you go, <laughs> he's making a phone call, all right? Wrong. He's making a phone call at 70 miles an hour. You can't see the 70 miles an hour because you're traveling at 70 miles an hour right? If you really want to know what is happening, you have to be stationary on the hard shoulder to be able to see somebody whizzing by at 70 miles an hour making a phone call. If you are traveling with it, you don't see the difference. So if you are an emotion, you wouldn't see it going from low to high. You must be independent of that emotion. In order to be able to detect the low point, detect the high point. You have to be independent of it, otherwise you would not detect the change. And in order to be able to detect the change, you must be stationary. Right? You must be stationary from your states of emotion. Otherwise you will not be able to know how far you are up and down in your current state of happiness. If you're stationary from all of your thought points, all right, then you have to consider, I'm stationary from all states of perception, I'm stationary from all states of emotion, all right, perception, emotion, memory, I'm, I'm independent of all of these things in order to be able to detect them changing. I can't be any of those things. All right. Furthermore, I must have existed before those states. You know, uh, the simplest question to ask somebody is, do you exist? All right. And most people say, I mean, some people are a bit odd. Most people say, yes, I do exist. And you have to say, how do you know? They say, oh, don't ask such a simple question. Of course I know. How I exist. How do you know? Well, Ram told us that there's six means of knowing. All right? I exist because I can see myself. All right? In the mirror. Can you? You can see, you can see a body. All right? The body is seen. That's the object. And the, see, the seeing is the process of seeing. Who's the eye that's seeing the body? All right? So you know that you exist, and because it's the only thing that you know in the world without a means of knowing, this becomes the central pin of Vedanta. You start from that point, because everything else is a maybe. Everything else you come to know through a means of knowing. And anything that you come to know through a means of knowing is subject to interpretation. Right? The sky is blue. Wrong. All right? The sun rises. Wrong. There's lots of things that we know 
that if you actually analyze, they're, they're not true. And once you come to know, you can, you can modify the knowledge that you had. The only thing that you know for certain is that you exist. What's odd is that you don't know the means by which you know that you exist. You can't see it, you can't think it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it, right? You just know that you exist. This thing, that by which you know you exist, is consciousness. Right? That by which you come to know is consciousness. It's not a person, it's not a thing, and it's stationary. How old is it? I mean, if this thing, that by which you know, everything else that you know has an age, whether it be, it, you know, a single molecule or a stone or a whole planet, everything has an age. How old is consciousness? When's the, when's the first time you knew a thought? When you were three, four, five? What do you remember your first thought to be? Somewhere at an early age, all right? That by which you know, you knew that thought, and that by which you now know your thoughts, what's the difference? How much older is the awareness now than it was then? Has it aged? Certainly what it's aware of has aged. You go to the man, oh God, oh my God. That's why I always say, take lovely pictures and enjoy the pictures of you now, because in 10 years time you say, oh my God, I was so beautiful 10 years ago, all right? So enjoy your pictures now, because certainly the awareness by which you came to know those things does not seem to have aged. Does the awareness have any size? Think about it. How large is your awareness? What do you think? Three inches? Six inches? <clears throat> Foot? Is it square? Is it round? How, what's the size of your awareness? And you come to realize that it has no size. If something has no size, it's funny, it has no time. Because dimension and time are associated. Right. That's why Einstein talked about this space-time continuum. Because time is the, is the time required to go from one part of something to another. You need a dimension of space in order to have time. If you don't have space, you get a singularity, and there is no time. Time is an invention of size. They go together suddenly you realize that you can't place your awareness. You don't know how big it is. You don't know how old it is. You don't know what size it is. And it is stationary. All right? But clearly, we've all got it. There's something that by which you know your thoughts and that by which I know my thoughts. All right? So if we said that this awareness is Atma, which is the word that's typically given to consciousness from the perspective of the individual. You have your Atma, I have my Atma, all right? <coughs> to me, because my world is centered around me, I have my Atma, and everything around me is not my Atma. Because I'm the knower, everything else is known. Okay? So, me, it's called Atma, everything is called Anatma. Now, you say to yourself, well, hang on a minute, Ram. I've got my Atma, and everything around me other than me is Anatma. It gets really confusing. So I've got here Atma, you are, you are Anatma to me, and you have your Atma, and I'm Anatma to you. All right? So what is Atma, what is Anatma? And how many Atmas are there? You say, oh, that's easy. We've got one in each of us, right? There's Atmas, plenty of Atmas, about six billion walking around the planet. And maybe one in every plant, 
and one in every creature. There's, uh, there's individual atmas. Where does your atma begin and mine finish? If you haven't got an atma, that by which you know the world, where does yours stop and my begin? Simple enough question. If you have two things, where does one thing stop and the other one start? All right? You say, well, that's easy, Ram. My atma finishes at my skin. All right? Beyond my skin is not me. Because when you go like that, it hurts me. All right? When I wear a ring, that ring is clearly not me, but the finger on which the ring is, is me. So it's nice to be able to say the skin is the, the, the end, the end point of where I begin. Then there's some gap, and then your skin begins, so your aftermath is inside there. All right? But we've already said that the body is not me. Then you have to roll it up and say, oh, my atma is inside my brain, all right? But we've already said the thoughts are not you. Atma is not there. And atma has to be stationary. It has no size. It has no dimension. And if it has no size and it's independent of time, that's why it's incapable of change. Think about it. When something changes, it goes from one state to another. All right? I was standing up, and then I sit down. I know I'm the same height in both, but that's neither here nor there. Okay? So there's a change of state that says you're standing up, action, you're sitting down. There's, a, there's, a, there's one state moves to another. All right? And there's a time in there. There's a space in there in which you occupy the standing location and the sitting location. Something that is independent of space and time is incapable of change. And it has to be incapable of change because you're the guy standing on the hard shoulder incapable of change so that you can observe all the change around you. So Atma doesn't change. It's independent of size, independent of time, the only conclusion that you can come to is Atma is not inside me, but I'm inside Atma. If it's got no size and no state of change, then it has no edge. Think about it. This stage has got a size, you go along the stage, there's an edge at which the stage is no more. And there's a change of state. Stage? No stage. If something is independent of change, then it is infinite. Because if something needs a boundary in order to have a point of change, this tent has a boundary for you to be able to say, I'm inside the tent, I'm outside the tent. Okay, so if something is infinite, where do I fit in? If something is infinite, where do I fit in? Because I've always thought I'm a finite human being. And this is the problem. When you put something finite, into something infinite, then you make the infinite finite. If infinite is everything, all right? I know in mathematical terms we have huge infinite and smaller infinite. I always, uh, I always get coupled with the story that says an infinite hotel has an infinite number of rooms and another guest has arrived. How do you put them in, all right? And the answer is easy you ask every guest to move to the next room, right? And room number one becomes vacant, and that's where you put the new guest. I know. So infinite is so large, okay, that when you put something finite into infinite, you make the infinite finite. 
because the infinite must include you. If something has no dimension, no time, no edge, and is vast, without an edge, without a change of state, then we must be within it rather than it being within us. And this is the strange thing. It means that you and I must be within it rather than it being within us. That means that consciousness must be something, a single thing, that is driving that by which all of us know our thoughts. You say, Ram, I really don't follow that because I have no way of knowing the thoughts in your head. If we're all one consciousness, why don't I know what you're thinking? Well, first of all, you don't know what I'm thinking because it's happening in a subtle body and none of your perceptors are able to receive items in a subtle body. We only know what somebody is thinking by the physical actions that come out through the physical body. You know, somebody's sad, somebody's happy, only because of the way that they're portraying that in a way that your perceptors can actually perceive it. That's the only way you're going to come to know. But if we're this one underlying thing by which our thoughts are known, how come I don't know your thoughts? It's a good question to ask. And how come I feel that there's a separate me? And Vedanta says, number of examples. I'll give you the old example. The old example says, number of pots, clay pots, different sizes, all right, different quality, whole pots, crack pots, the, the whole, whole series of pots. The pots represent us individuals as bodies. Inside is water, all right, and the water represents the subtle body. Up above in the sky is a sun, single sun. You look into every pot and you will see the sun in its entirety. Every pot, irrespective of its size and the amount of water. All right. So there can be one that is seen amongst many. But how come that one light that you see within that pot thinks it's a separate sun to the one that's up above. It's borrowed. The sun that you see on the water is a reflection. It's borrowed from the original. It's not intrinsic to that. What do we mean by intrinsic? Something that cannot be separated from its object is called intrinsic. Right. So you have the single sun shining. Modern example of it is that you have a room like this, tent like this, and it's got diffused lighting, right? Very clever diffused lighting. We analyzed it. We call it the sun. So the sunlight falls upon the tent and is going around and bashing around and moving around everywhere. And we can see around this entire tent as a result of the light. All right, and the light bounces up people and comes to our eyes and gets analyzed in the brain and that's the only place we see. We don't know actually whether all of you exist or not, but we, I perceive it inside my mind, okay? Now, when the sun shines and I go out there and I hold a mirror and I take a reflection on the mirror and I put that reflection on one of these walls, what will I see? I will see a shiny spot on the wall that is shaped the size of the mirror all right and you say bright spot all right analyze what is the light that you're seeing where it's bright you're seeing the reflected light of the sun but actually you're also seeing the diffused light of the sun that was there before the reflection landed correct on that piece of the tent wall are both pieces of light. First of all, the diffused original light and the reflected light that you have just shone upon it is two lots. 
but the reflection of the sun is so powerful, so strong, you can't see the diffuse light. But the light came from the sun. The same sun that gave you diffuse light everywhere is now giving you a more powerful light at a particular location. That light doesn't come from the mirror, it's borrowed from the sun. So in much the same way, our minds act as the mirror and reflects the power of consciousness upon our mind and we think we're terribly bright. Right? What we see is that powerful, powerful reflection. What we forget is the background that was already there. Right? And we say, and it is such a powerful light, and the mind is the reflecting medium. The subtle body is the reflecting medium. It's acting as the mirror that reflects light. And that light, consciousness is the original, because we have reflected consciousness, we borrow the light, we borrow the consciousness, suddenly we say, ta-da, sentient being. All right? But we borrowed it. We know we borrowed it because that light itself gets borrowed by one other entity and it's called the physical body. So just as consciousness shines with the mirror, the reflecting medium of our mind, to make the mind sentient, so the mind passes on that light to the body, and the body gets that light as well, and it says, I'm a sentient being. I am now conscious. It's a borrowed level of consciousness. You know, because if it was intrinsic to the body, You'd never have a dead body. Right? You know there are moments when, when this consciousness leaves the body. It's called death. Right? And it's going to happen to all of us. And then the mind goes away. What, what actually happens with the dead body is that the prana, the mind, the subtle body leaves it. And since subtle body is the reflective medium of consciousness, then the body becomes unconscious. It returns to what it was, simple matter, all the time, without showing any of the properties of consciousness that we gave onto it. Right? Consciousness is not an intrinsic property of the body or the mind. It's borrowed light. Just like a mirror borrows the light as it shines upon the wall. And this light is so bright in our minds that we think we are it, the man, all right? And we're playing around with borrowed light. The moment the mirror cracks, we're done for, all right? The mind is a reflective medium. That's what makes us think that we are controlling this situation, that we are the consciousness. But the consciousness is one without size, without time, without edge from which we borrow to give ourselves this idea of this egoic I. Once you come to understand is that by which you know all of your thoughts, that by which everybody knows all of their thoughts is the one single element. That has to be the ultimate subject. That has to be the ultimate knower Actually, it's no. It's not the ultimate knower. It's the ultimate subject, that by which knowing is done. Right? It does not participate in anything. The reason why consciousness can't participate in anything is because it's incapable of change. You try participating in something if you're not going to move. All right? If you're incapable of change, you're not going to participate in anything. All you can do is be like the sunlight shining. It does not care whether you, you go out into the bright sunshine or you go into the shadow. It will just shine. But by the light of that shining, you will come to know what is in the room, 
what is outside right it does not choose where to shine it just shines all the time but it is that by which we come to know is consciousness right? and it's because it's infinite because it has no edge there can only be one so we are all one this is the one consciousness advaita vedanta this is not two right and it is the driving force it is the driving force for everything else that we do because everything else we do we through through our mind and our mind is only our mind as a result of the borrowed light from this single consciousness and our mind is the reflective medium once you come to realize this right the world changes because somebody arguing with you is the mind arguing right is not the ultimate subject because the ultimate subject that's arguing with you is your ultimate subject so you ultimately are the same ultimate that this person you're arguing with there is no difference why would you hit someone if there was no difference would you be hitting yourself right you perceive the world that is also borrowing from this single consciousness right why would there be a problem with you interacting with the world why would you want to abuse it because the one consciousness that is you is the consciousness by which all living things appear in front of you so you never abuse the world you can know this intellectually fascinating subject you come to hear it is the same simple message i mean it's, it's actually not very complicated i mean there's bits of algebra that's much more complicated than this so it's not very complicated and all these teachers will be telling you the same thing at various levels we bring these teachers so that at some point whatever your level of understanding is you will achieve the aha moment that's an oprah saying the aha moment that says that oh i've suddenly come to realize what this is about it is that by which you come to know that is the ultimate subject that ultimate subject is you you're incapable of change you're infinite you're timeless meaning you're immortal all right you just appear like this and because of the reflective medium you go through all those thoughts and all those things and all these arguments with your partners and all of those things and it's immaterial you are the ultimate consciousness that drives all of them does anybody have any questions yes um apologies for using a very simple trying to focus on the questions and not to lose it, yeah? So, um, from day one, when we're born, we start to receive information, and uh, our mind, our intelligence is totally okay with it. So, if we're told that the glass is hard, that the fire is, uh, can burn you, the yep. water is wet, yes. you accept it, yes, without any questions, you just accept it. There's also moments in time when we are told one thing, and then, we understand that the truth is slightly different and we also accept that, right? So when, we, when I was little, I was told that I was found in cabbage, I don't know, Russian expression, and I realized that there is a more pleasant process of making kids. And again, my mind and my intelligence was totally fine with it. But for instance, listening yourself, listening other swamis and intelligent people, my little eye is very resisting in accepting this information yes opposite to daily kind of like um experience right? exactly and i classify myself or my, my mind my intelligence as relatively open i would never say like oh because i've never experienced that i will never believe that however listening you even today there was three or four times so it's like <laughs> you know whoa, 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 right um so when you said that there is a very powerful, very powerful ultimate 
consciousness or um, mind behind all this? Why there is so much resistance? Why this, whatever you will call it, doesn't help us to receive this information in, in a much easier way? Why do we need to go to such a long you know, journey and with such much, much resistance? It's because all of our, the, the question is that if, if this was really the, the ultimate truth, how come it's so very difficult to, to understand this, to live it, and so forth? It's, it's because we, we are, as you said, we are trained right from the beginning to be self-sufficient in terms of treating all of your experiences to be the underlying reality. But you come to realize that if you have an experience, that experience is an object, there's a process of experiencing, and there's an experiencer. Right? And you have to say, you are the experiencer, you're not the experience. So even if we have a wonderful realization in meditation, suddenly it goes all glowing light with blue stripes and things, you know, you haven't reached nirvana, it's an experience. And somebody's sitting there being the experiencer. And because in the general world, in the materialistic world, we are taught to perform these things, we, we, we are taught to be the individual that's in command of all of this thing in order to have a, a transactional life but we're also given the intellect to be able to analyze what we do and how we think so it's a it's a process by which we can live our individual lives successfully but at the same time we're giving the we're given the intellectual capacity to be able to analyze the ultimate truth we tend to believe this transactional experience because this is what we do day in, day out. All right? And it becomes easy to believe until somebody says, this is, is different to this way. All right? And you just have to carry on thinking about it and say, yes, is this an experience? If this is an experience, this is an object. I'm the perceiver of the experience. The, the experiencer and the experience cannot be the same thing. <laughs> Ultimate, you always have to say, the experiencer and the experienced cannot be the same thing. I am the eternal experiencer. Just takes time. Got five minutes. Yes. Um, sorry, we'll, be, we'll have come to you next, sorry. Right. So, in order to, in order to have this idea that we are different, all right, with something that we've all, you are different to me, and you know I'm different to you. In, in order to do that, you have to ask. Remember, one of the first questions I said is, "Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going?" Right. You have to understand why is it that I'm different to you. Physically, mentally, intellectual ability, whatever it is, physical ability, I'm different to you. Why? I'm clearly different. In this transactional world, we're all different. What makes it? Is it some big power on the above says, you're going to be tall, you're going to be short, you know, live with it? No. All right? So the Vedanta talks about and describes why we are the way we are why we are different, why we think differently, is as a result of our own actions in the past. All right. So these have accumulated into results which must be executed, must be experienced. And the physical body with the mental ability, whatever that we're born with, is the perfect vehicle for the karmic results that we have withdrawn from our karmic bank to come into this life with. We have got everything that we need in order to exhaust 
the karmic results that we have inherited, the withdrawal at our birth time. That's what makes us think differently. All right. Yes, final question. Um, so, I understand, my understanding is like through the droplet and the oceans, the droplet coat. And so, so therefore the, the droplet at any time can experience the whole of the ocean um, <coughs> and, and so become everything. And that at the moment in time, we've got quantum physics uh, working with that, is that we're all energy, and best energy. And then, then you start to ask yourself, well, what is complete consciousness? For example, would it be love? Would, would, it, would ultimate consciousness say, well, everything's love, and therefore would its ultimate expression of itself be love? But then there's this interesting thing about frequency, the different frequencies of everything. And also an idea that we can be the whole of the ocean and then become the droplet. The whole of the ocean, that this speed of which we do that is based on something called superconductivity which is essentially the, the, the speed of we're in the mundane now, which is about 100 electrons per second, but we can go up to 10,000 electrons per second, potentially within the existence that we are, for things like monotop gold and other materials that then suggest that we can become interdimensional. The yogis and especially the Hare Krishnas are always talking about you can travel through other dimensions. And what my question is, is, is there a technique to increase this vibration to a point of actually being able to achieve that, and is it understood through the Parishas that there are multiple dimensions that we travel through? That's about 101 questions, isn't it? <laughs> 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 right, let's start with the first one. The little drop can never experience itself as the ocean. If you are a drop, right, you are water. Once you're water in the, in the ocean, you cannot experience yourself. The fish, right, don't know that they're in water. They're not really experiencing it. It's, it's their environment around them. You cannot, you cannot have, the, the difference between the drop and the ocean is the perspective. It's the difference between me being father to my son and being, my, uh, being a son to my father. I'm the same thing, but I have different names, all right? So who I am is not determined by the roles that I play, and I can play multiple roles at the same time. A drop is something, a role that I'm currently playing as water. Later on, I can become a bigger drop, a wave, a spray, or whatever. That'll be my role. I'll always be water, all right? If that water is infinite, Infinity must include everything, because that's what infinity is. Infinity, therefore, must include all vibrational frequencies. All right. It is infinite, and therefore there's no point in saying, I'm going to go from this vibration to that vibration. I now have a higher level of consciousness. All right. It's like saying, I'm going to swim from the English Channel into the Atlantic. I'm going into different water. You're not. All right? Duality. Yes. And there's this idea that there's duality. And then outside duality, there's another. That's why I brought, this is something I prepared earlier, as all cooks <laughs> said. <laughs> <laughs> So there's this simple pamphlet that I, I produced. It's called um, A Guide to Vedanta. It's published by the charity. And there's a box of it over there. If you care to give a five pound donation, you can have one of these things. And the second section deals with all the little bits of objects that are around you that I haven't had a chance to discuss today. I would recommend it. But you know, it's, it is the work of many I just compiled it together to give a little simple guidance of Vedanta. So, I think we have to bring it to a stop there. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>